We can now start with the second part of the course, Mechanical Vibrations. And this is work that has been done in collaboration with uh, Vincent Froment. Uh, I want to thank him for the good collaboration these uh, three last years. Well, I'll first start with an outline and, of course, first the introduction in which I talk about vibration analysis and why it's important. And then I explain the vibration mechanism. Of course, it involves springs, damping, and inertia elements. And I'll go a little bit in the detail of that. And then I'll talk about analysis in the time domain and in the frequency domain. The second section is about second-order oscillatory systems. And this section should be very familiar to you because the biggest parts of the main parts have been covered in courses such as digital control and state space control. In the third section, we look at the one degree of freedom spring mass system and we consider different sources of excitation, external forces, base excitation and rotational imbalance. And then we look at the uh, engineering implications and we look at uh, how we can uh, mitigate the effects of uh, vibration. The next section is about multiple degrees of freedom systems. We first start with two and n degree of freedom systems, and then we go to bodies which are continuous in nature, and these have, of course, an infinite number of degrees of freedom. We consider two cases. First, longitudinal vibration in a bar, and then the second one is a case of a beam in bending. Very often the system is complex, but we can work with reduced complexity systems. Section 5 is about applications. The first application is a building that is subjected to wind or an earthquake, and then we want to compute the eigenfrequency and eigenmodes. The second application is the application of a glider that is landing, and again, the eigenfrequencies and eigenmodes are being computed. As you can see, there are very few examples, and this is where I'm counting on you. I hope that in next year's version of the course, there will be a lot more uh, application. Section 6 is simply a dictionary English-French uh, that might help you in the understanding of the course. Well, vibration is often the combination of looseness something that is not firmly attached, something that is rolling, something that is rubbing, in combination with some external source, uh, external force. For instance, in a rotating machine, it could be unbalanced or misalignment. And this vibration, uh, combination of looseness with some external force, gets amplified because of some structural resonance frequency and it can become a major vibration and noise source. There are a number of reasons why vibration analysis is important. The first reason could be the construction of mathematical models so that we can model vibration and pre-compute resonance uh, frequencies. It's important to know these because we want to avoid exciting them on our machines so that we avoid exceeding limits such as fatigue limits. We also want to understand the mechanism of vibration so that we can dampen or isolate undesirable vibrations. Vibration analysis is also important because we want to assess the mechanical condition of the machine through analysis of time domain or frequency domain uh, techniques. And the idea is to predict mechanical faults. Uh, what it could be, for instance, on a rotating machine that there is imbalance, that there is misalignment, or that on this machine there is a, a faulty bearing. And we want to predict that in order to reduce the occurrence of unplanned, unplanned shutdowns. Yeah? The idea is that you schedule service maintenance in advance so that you don't have these shutdowns, and this is called preventive maintenance. Well, you certainly remember the curve that you see here on the screen, which is obtained using a static tensile test, and it's for materials which are called ductile, such as aluminium, copper, and steel. 
and you see that these ductile materials are displaying linear elastic behavior up to point three here yeah and from point three to point two you have still elastic behavior but it becomes non-linear okay then you see that up to point two you have elastic behavior that means that the deformation is recoverable beyond that point two well the deformation is non-recoverable okay so the material will not uh, return to its original uh, shape and uh, size this sigma one here that corresponds to this point here well it's called the ultimate tensile strength or simply tensile strength and it's the maximum strain that a material can uh, withstand before breaking down okay what we do here in this slide is compare a static analysis with a dynamic analysis on the left side you see that the stress is gradually increased it's increased very slowly until the stress goes above the tensile strength and we know from the previous slide that you have destruction that you have fracture okay so this is the static analysis where things are going rather slowly here we have a total different uh, situation in this dynamic analysis you see that the stress is going up and down in a sine wave of a given uh, frequency and we see here that you can have fracture far below the tensile strength you can have even fracture below the proportional elasticity limit this is because of a phenomenon that is called fatigue well fatigue is characterized by the so-called Wöhler curve or SN curve the S uh, stands for cyclic uh, stress and that's the S and it's on the Y axis and the N is the cycles to failure and that's what you see on the X axis and this curve is obtained by applying regular sinusoidal stress and counting the number of cycles to failure as you can see if the stress is higher the number of cycles to failure is smaller well fatigue can have very destructive effects and fatigue detection should always be part of the maintenance program here you see the result of fatigue on Haloa Fly 243 in 1988. As you can see, part of the fuselage came off because maintenance failed to detect the presence of fatigue damage. As for any uh, response in vibration analysis, of course you have transients and you have steady state. Huh? For instance, if the machine starts, you have a transient with peak values in general and then you have the steady state so for a mechanical structure it's during the transient that you see the highest displacements the highest deformation and this is where of course the risk is the highest to exceed the tensile strength in steady state well that occupies most of the parts life and this is where the risk of fatigue failure is the highest well, there are a number of tools that you can use for vibration analysis. The first tool is mathematical modeling, and it will do a lot of that in this course. You obtain a mathematical model from the system, either a simple one or a more complex one, and then you use it, for instance, to compute the eigenfrequencies or the eigenmodes. You can do experimentation on the system and for that you have to use what is called a modal shaker and the idea is that you apply a sinusoidal excitation to the system and then you collect a signal and then you look at the amplitude gain and the phase shift and what you obtain is a body diagram but an experimental body diagram what you can do also is uh, do measurements uh, with uh, for instance an accelerometer or a microphone that is attached to the surface and then do the analysis in the time domain or in the frequency domain in the frequency domain you know that you have to use the discrete Fourier transform and then you use and this very efficient 
uh, algorithm that you know, which is the fast Fourier transform. As I said, one way is to use experimentation. And what you see here on the left is what is called a modal hammer. Okay, so here you have the hammer and here you have the measurements. So this allows you to do experimentations and to obtain kind of a, an experimental impulse uh, response. On the right, you have the modal shaker. And this one allows you to apply a sinusoidal excitation and then you collect the response on different spots and this type of data can allow you to obtain a model based on experimentation. Well, vibrations are actually oscillations around an equilibrium uh, position and vibration is initiated when an inertia element, think of a mass when you have a movement in translation and a moment of inertia when you have uh, a movement in a rotation and when this inertia element is displaced from its original equilibrium position then you have forces acting on this element and the first one that is acting is the restoring force it's a conservative force uh, that is developed from a potential energy element think of a spring gravity or buoyancy and this restoring force is pulling the element back towards equilibrium and then of course you have non-conservative forces that are acting on this element well you have friction forces uh, which dissipate energy and you have also external forces that are being applied that add energy to the system well here you can recognize the spring mass system that you uh, know very well and we assume here that there are only uh, conservative forces that are acting and there are no uh, non-conservative forces such as uh, dissipation friction and things like that when you have that the total energy kinetic energy plus potential energy is preserved it's a constant right and what you see in a vibration mechanism is that you have this constant exchange between potential energy to kinetic energy and backwards yeah so here on the left you see the situation where the potential energy is maximum okay so the restoring force is maximum and it pulls the mass back to its original uh, position and here you see that the kinetic uh, energy is at its maximum right the potential energy is zero so the restoring force is zero but because of the inertia well the mass element will go much further right and here you have arrived at a situation where the potential energy is again as its maximum the speed goes to zero uh, so the kinetic energy is zero and again you have this restoring force that is pulling the element back okay so vibration is kind of this exchange between potential and kinetic energy from one to the other and backwards well, we've seen this transfer between potential energy to kinetic energy and backwards that characterizes uh, vibration. In the previous example, uh, the restoring force was deriving from a potential which came uh, uh, from a spring. Uh, so the, the potential energy is the uh, energy stored in the spring. Here, the restoring uh, force derives from gravity and the potential energy comes from gravity but the principle is exactly the same uh, you see again this transfer from potential to kinetic energy and backwards in the next example it's again the same principle but uh, the potential uh, energy comes from buoyancy well, you encounter free and forced uh, vibration free vibration is induced by an excitation which is very short in nature for instance the impulse and you can see it as a response with an initial condition and then the free uh, response of the system 
Well, you have also responses which are forced. Uh, there are external forces acting on the system which add energy to the system and they can come in uh, the three forms. Either the excitation is harmonic, it's a sinusoidal wave, think of a rotating machine with imbalance, or it can be periodic but non harmonic and then you know from this uh, uh, Fourier series that you have the fundamental frequency that is exciting the system but probably also some harmonics of that uh, fundamental frequency and a good example of that is a, a piston engine which generates a periodic excitation and then of course you have excitation which is a random in nature think of uh, for instance forces generated by the wind by nature they are uh, random and if you want to know the frequency content of that excitation well you can use the uh, discrete Fourier transform well as I just said uh, free vibration is characterized by a short initial excitation and then you have the free response of the system and in a force vibration well you have a continuous excitation here we have a washing machine and as the clothes of that are in the washing machine are not spread uniformly over this washing machine there is some kind of unbalance and this unbalance causes a continuous excitation well, here you see the three types of forced uh, vibration and uh, when it's forced vibration it means that it's uh, continuous over time yeah? it's continuing in time the first example is simply a harmonic excitation for instance here uh, the example is a modal shaker and the input is a sinusoidal wave if you look at uh, the spectrum of course you see only a spike at one frequency Another example of that is periodic excitation, uh, this example of the piston, and what you see then is a spectrum where you have a spike at the harmonic uh, or fundamental frequency and at one or more harmonics of this uh, frequency. An example here uh, of uh, a gear train where the excitation is more random in nature okay and then if you look at the spectrum well you see contributions at a lot of frequencies well when you talk about vibration in the framework of mechanics uh, vibration in a mechanical system there is always a spring that comes into play and a spring is actually a flexible mechanical link in practice the spring of course it's itself a continuous system uh, which means that it has a certain mass but in practice very often the mass is small with respect to the other masses in the mechanical system so in the first instance it will be neglected but we'll come back to that uh, uh, later if we can neglect the mass of this spring we can assume that the force on both ends of the spring by Newton's third law are the same in magnitude well when there is no f uh, force acting on the spring we can uh, measure its length and this is what we call the unstretched uh, length and then we have to apply a certain force uh, on the spring to make sure that its length changes by a quantity x and what we'll assume here since the spring is made of a flexible material is that this force f is a continuous function f of x where x is the change in length well we have just seen that if we want to have a change in length by x with respect to the unstretched length we have to apply a force capital f which is a continuous function of x and this continuous function is f of x now what we can do is compute the Taylor series of this function f of x and in general this is what we obtain we do this Taylor series around x equals zero we see of course that k zero is equal to zero because we know that if, if there is no elongation no change in length with respect to the uh, unstretched length we know that f is equal to zero
for a lot of elastic uh, materials we know that if you apply a tensile or traction force or if you apply a compressive force the change in length will be the same okay so the compressive and the tensile forces will be the same up to a change of sign and this means that this function f of x is odd this also means that in the taylor series we can remove all exponents with a even exponent and we arrive at an expression of f of x which is only composed of exponents which are odd well we've seen from the previous expression that all springs are uh, non-linear uh, because you had terms uh, k3 x cube acting uh, so we had this uh, restoring force f of x is equal to k1x plus etc but in many situations well the inundation uh, the change of length with respect to the uh, unstretched length if it's small enough well these terms here since they are cubed or the exponent 5 etc they will become very small so very often we use the approximation of a linear spring uh, which is often good enough for our applications and then we obtain the force displacement law that you all know force is equal to kx okay so this is in expressed in newton this is expressed in meters so of course the coefficient k which we call the spring stiffness is expressed in newton per meter well what you see here on this slide is a result that we've already seen in the first part of the course uh, here what is computed is the work done by the spring force as its point of application moves from uh, point one to point two and you arrive at this expression of the work and you can see that the work only depends on the initial and final position of the point application uh, the point of application of the spring force and it does not depend on the path of the system so we know that the spring force is conservative okay and if it's conservative well it derives from a potential function okay and this potential function is written by this equation and indeed the work is the difference between the potential energy at point one minus the potential energy at point two so what you see here on the string is a bar in uh, traction and we assume that there is a movement in the longitudinal x uh, direction because of a force acting on the system and we are going to look at the change in length from the unstretched length uh, l right and we will see that we can approximate this by a spring as defined previously we know from our tensile test string that there is a relation between stress and strain in the elastic uh, region and that this relation between stress and strain is proportional and the proportionality factor is actually Young's elastic modulus where E is expressed in Newton per square meter. We are of course interested in looking at the relation between the applied force and x the elongation the change of length between uh, with respect to the unstretched length l and if you look at that you simply have to make sure that this one goes on the other side here you arrive at this uh, relation here force is k times x where k is expressed by the ratio e Young's modulus times the cross section divided by the unstretched length and this is indeed a stiffness that is expressed in Newton per, me per meter yes you have to just verify with the uh, units well what you have seen uh, previously is a spring uh, 
where you apply a certain force and this force causes a linear displacement in change of length with respect to the unstretched length. Well, you have something similar for an uh, excitation, which is torque. Okay, so if you apply a torque to a certain mechanical system, well, you have an angular displacement and this is called a torsional spring. And just as when we have assumed that F is equal to K, x okay so that the force causes a linear uh, displacement okay well we'll assume that for small angular displacements theta that there is a linear relation between the applied torque and the angular displacement that you see and this proportionality factor we'll call the torsional stiffness okay since this is expressed uh, in the units of a torque newton meter and this is expressed in radians well of course the torsional stiffness will have units newton meter over radians Previously, we have considered the bar in traction and we have seen that we can approximate it by a spring, a linear spring. Here you have the bar in torsion. So a torque is applied and because of this torque that is applied on the system, well, you have a torsion and an angle theta that is uh, produced. So the idea is to have a link between this torque that is uh, acting on the system and the theta that is uh, produced. And we can see here that you can approximate this system and the bar in torsion by a linear torsional spring. What is important to see is that the movement here in this direction is indeed theta. Okay, and that the mass that you had previously is, of course, here replaced by the moment of inertia of uh, this piece that is act, uh, added to the uh, to the bar, and the torsional spring is obtained by this expression here. And it's obtained from a relation that looks a lot like the previous relation. And what we had here previously is force over cross-section. Uh, this is stress is equal to X over L, which is a strain. And you have here Young's modulus. There is something similar here in torsion. I want to don't want to go too much in the details, but E is replaced by G here, which is the shear modulus, and section is replaced by KG, the torsional constant. And again, you obtain uh, an expression of the torsional spring. So the important message here is that this bar in torsion can be expressed using a torsional spring which has a given uh, expression so what you see here is what is called a cantilever with an end mass so you have the end mass over here and the cantilever here it's a beam which is attached on one end and which is free to move on the other end and now we considering bending okay so we're considering the motion in the y direction right and we considering a force that is acting in the same uh, direction and the uh, the nice thing is that this uh, system can be also approximated by a linear spring right here we recognize the mass the force that is acting and this motion now is the motion in the y direction and it can be shown that the relation between F and Y is K. So this is the equivalent stiffness. And this equivalent stiffness depends on the length L of the beam, Young's modulus, and a new parameter, which is the area moment of inertia. Okay, so again, another system. 
uh, which is a beam that is supported on both sides and where you have a mass at a mid span and we are also considering here the movement in this y direction okay i didn't put any forces on here but you could add force f and this type of system can be also approximated by a linear spring right you see the linear spring here you have the force f and you have a relation between the force f and the displacement y and it's again an equivalent stiffness that is a function of the same parameters as in the previous example you will find a lot of these examples in the literature for other types of uh, systems well we see here a system where there are uh, n springs acting in parallel on this system and of course the idea is that we would like to replace this n springs by one equivalent uh, spring acting on the uh, system well we see that both systems are subjected to the same uh, force and that the change in length with respect to the unstretched length should be the same on the right hand side we see that the relation between f and x is simply k equivalent times x on the other side we see that f okay the force that is applied is actually the sum of the different restoring forces so f is k1 x plus k2 x etc so you can write it like this so now you have one relation that links k equivalent with the different uh, stiffnesses in the system and you arrive at this relation the equivalent stiffness is simply the sum of the uh, stiffnesses of the springs that are in parallel well let us now look at what happens if you have springs in a series okay the idea is again of course that you replace the system with one spring which is called the equivalent spring again you have the same external force f and we're going to make sure that the change in length is equal again on in both system well for the second system it's kind of obvious the change of length is simply f over the equivalent stiffness and in the second uh, system in the first system here that is displayed well x here results from different changes in length x1 x2 up to xn and each change of length well it's the same force that is being applied divided by the corresponding stiffness okay so x is x1 plus x2 uh, up to xn you can replace this by this expression here and now you can kind of eliminate the f's right and you obtain the relation for the equivalent uh, stiffness and what you see is that the equivalent stiffness is always smaller than each individual uh, stiffness well so far we have considered that the spring did not have any mass but in some cases well uh, the mass of the spring has to be taken into consideration and if it is taken into consideration you will see that different sections of the spring will be moving at the speed that is different than that of the mass right well how can we simplify things well the idea will be to use uh, a system where we use a spring without mass but that we change the mass of the system that is attached to it from m to something that is different from m and the idea is that we can kind of predict correctly the behavior of the system using this massless spring plus this equivalent mass
Well, let us now pursue our idea of effective uh, mass. We'll assume that the speed of the mass is V, and now it's easy to compute the kinetic energy of the mass, which is given by this expression. And of course, the idea will be to compute the kinetic energy associated with the spring. And we'll assume that this spring is has a mass M of S. And uh, to do that, we'll consider a very thin segment dy of the spring which is uh, given over here and we'll consider the distance y from the fixed end of the uh, spring and to compute kinetic energy we'll have to know what the speed is and of course we know that the speed will be different for different sections of uh, the spring uh, this is because our spring now has a mass m of s and it's kind of intuitive to see that well on this end of the spring well you'll have a speed of v and over here at the fixed end of the spring you'll have a speed of zero so the idea is that well the speed is actually proportional to the distance y and you obtain this kind of relation you see that if y is equal to zero at the fixed end of the spring you have a speed which is zero and if y is equal to l indeed this quantity here will be equal to the speed v okay so we'll assume that the mass is uniformly distributed and now we can look at the mass of an element of length dy and this is this very thin element and we can compute that its mass is dm okay it's the mass of the total spring divided by its length times the width of this element uh, dy now we can compute the kinetic energy of an element of length dy located in y it's simply its speed times its squared times its mass and now we can uh, integrate that over the interval 0 over L so now it's simply going over the mass so this thing here times this one is dm right and this thing here times this thing here is the speed squared okay and if you do the math well you see that the expression that you obtain is the following one so the kinetic energy of uh, the spring and only the spring it's a half times this thing here which is the mass of the spring divided by three times v squared so it's as if you had a spring of mass one third when you look at the kinetic energy so if you look now at the total kinetic energy well it's the kinetic energy associated with the mass kinetic energy associated with the spring and you obtained this expression here and this expression well it's as if you had an equivalent mass okay which is the mass and the original mass that you had plus one third of the mass of the spring so you can do as if you have a spring without mass okay but then you have to consider an equivalent mass which is the original mass plus one third of the mass of the spring well we've just considered the case of a mass with a spring that had a mass ms which could not be considered to be negligible and we've seen that you can kind of replace this by a springless mass with the same stiffness but you have to consider this equivalent mass which is the original mass plus one third of the uh, mass of the spring right so now we can kind of compute the natural frequency of this mass spring uh, system uh, with a heavy spring uh, heavy we mean that this mass ms is not negligible and we arrive at this uh, relation so it's the square root of the stiffness over the total equivalent mass that we have defined earlier and uh, which is this quantity over here
Well, a dashpot is a mechanical device that is added to a mechanical system to add damping. Uh, and it's called viscous damping. Viscous damping occurs in a mechanical system when a component of that system is in contact with a viscous liquid. The damping force that is, is produced is usually proportional to speed. Okay, so we have this kind of uh, a relation. So here we have Newton. Uh, force is expressed in Newton. There's the damping force and speed, of course, is in meters per second. So the coefficient between force and speed is called the viscous damping coefficient and it has units Newton times seconds divided by meters. Well, in the next few slides, uh, we explain the principle of a, a dashpot. What you see here is a plate. Okay. And this plate is connected to a rigid body. The rigid body and the plate slide over a reservoir of viscous uh, liquid. So here it is. And you've got it over here also. And this viscous liquid has a dynamic viscosity mu. The area of the plate that is in contact with the liquid is A. And so that's a section expressed in uh, meters squared. Well, there is actually a shear stress. Uh, stress is force over section that is developed between the fluid and the plate. And this creates a friction force that you see over here. And of course, this friction force, the idea is to link it to uh, the speed of the rigid body, the speed of the plate. So what we see here is that if the height of this reservoir is not too high, there will be a velocity profile in the liquid that will look like this. Okay, So it is approximately linear in the sense that when y is equal to h, okay, then you obtain a velocity or a speed of uh, v, which is the speed of the plate. And when you're at the bottom of this um, reservoir, then you have a speed which is zero. As we have said, there is a shear stress that is developed on the plate and it's determined by Newton's viscosity law. So this shear stress is the developed viscous friction force divided by section and it's proportional and the proportional factor is the dynamic viscosity with the variation of speed with respect to depth and since we have assumed here a, a speed profile which is linear and if you take the derivative with respect to, to y then you see that you have v over h right so now we can write the viscous friction force fd as a function of the speed Okay, viscous uh, force is stress times cross section, and you end up with a viscous force that is proportional to speed, and this is the damping coefficient, and it can be written as the dynamic viscosity mu times the cross section over the height, and so this is the damping coefficient of our dashpot. This is the damping coefficient that we had obtained and if this coefficient is large we'll have a large damping force. To make this damping coefficient large well we have to make sure that mu is uh, big yeah? and this will consist in using a very viscous uh, fluid. We have to make sure that the surface which is in contact with the uh, viscous fluid is as high as possible and that the height of the reservoir is as small as possible. Well, such a da dashpot design will lead to a very impractical uh, design and in practice will use a 
piston cylinder arrangement and this is what we'll see in the next slide okay so this is the piston cylinder dashboard and the formula which is of course much more complicated but the ideas remain the same you see that if the viscous uh, liquid that is used as a high dynamic viscosity you'll have a high damping coefficient right if the surface yeah becomes larger and that's the surface in contact with the viscous um, liquid is larger well the damping will go up and the damping coefficient will go up and if the distance between the piston and the cylinder goes down that's this d over here if it becomes smaller then the damping coefficient will also be higher well just as we had a torsional spring it's also possible to have a torsional damping and this is the equation that describes this torsional damping so here we have the torque that is produced uh, when there is an angular speed of theta dot okay so this is expressed in newton meter this is expressed in radians per second and this torsional viscous damping coefficient well it is expressed in this units right this one divided by this one well just as we did with springs we can put dampers in parallel and into series and we obtain exactly the same uh, formulas it's the same idea with displacement replaced by speed so if we have n damping elements and you put them in parallel you obtain the equivalent damping simply by adding the individual damping coefficients and if we put them in a series well we obtain the same formulas as with uh, springs the equivalent damping coefficient is obtained from the individual damping coefficients using this formula and we see that again that the equivalent damping coefficient is smaller than any of the other damping coefficients well we've seen in vibration that there is a restoring force that comes from a potential there is damping and there is also an inertia element uh, inertia is the property of matter to resist change in its state of uh, motion if you have a particle we've seen in the first part of the course that uh, mass is the only inertia property if you have a rigid body well then you have translational motion and then mass of the body is a measure of its inertia and the larger the mass the larger the inertia the greater the force that is required to change uh, speed in rotary motion the moment of inertia of the body is a me uh, measure of its inertia the larger the moment of inertia the greater the torque that is required to change rotational speed well we've seen also in the first part of the course that the moment of inertia does not only depend on mass but also how how this mass is distributed around the axis of uh, rotation we had seen that uh, elementary mass dm well it has a certain moment of inertia that depends on the square of its distance with respect to the axis of uh, rotation so this element uh, dm well it can be written as a density times a volume uh, so this is still the moment of inertia of a small particle but if we want to have the moment of inertia of the whole body we have to integrate this thing here over volume so using integration you can obtain the moment of inertia of rigid uh, bodies what we have to remember is that mass that is concentrated far away from the axis of a rotation will lead to a higher moment of inertia and the higher the moment of inertia the more difficult it becomes to change rotational velocity of the system
we had seen in the previous slide that the moment of inertia is the integral of r square over all elementary masses uh, dm and it can also be written as r square rho dv right this is called dm so now if we take the x-axis here and we can take an elementary mass dm here well it has a distance from the center of mass which is r but it can be written as y here z over here and what you have is r square is y square plus z square and you obtain this formula for the moment of inertia around the x-axis the two other formula can be found in a similar fashion well the formulas that you saw in the previous slide are uh, for a rotation around x-axis y-axis and z-axis for a reference frame that is such that the center of the reference frame is actually the center of mass you can then use these formulas and apply them to all kinds of rigid bodies and the uh, uh, slides that i will be showing you now are here for your information so here these formulas are applied to a rectangular parallelepiped, a thin plate, a cylinder, a thin rod, a thin disc, and then to a sphere. Well, the parallel axis theorem allows you to determine the moment of inertia of a rigid body, given that you know the moment of inertia around a parallel axis that goes through the uh, center of mass of that object okay and the par uh, the parallel axis theorem states that the moment of inertia around this new uh, axis is the one through uh, the center of mass plus m which is the mass of the object and d squared which is the parallel distance between the new axis of rotation and the one that is parallel to it but that goes through the center of mass so what we do here is explain the parallel axis theorem in an application to a thin rod we know that the moment of inertia for a thin rod when it's turning around the x-axis is given by this quantity over here and now we want to know what will be the moment of inertia if we turn around the axis that is given here and you see that it's parallel to x okay so if we apply to this uh, parallel axis theorem we say that the new moment of inertia around this axis given in purple it's the original moment of inertia plus a term that is obtained by m times d square and d here is the vertical distance okay so this vertical distance in our case is l over 2 okay so we have to add the term m l over 2 squared if you do the calculations this is what you obtain you see that the new moment of inertia is four times larger than the original one this is kind of logical because we know that the moment of inertia will be larger as there is more mass far away from the axis of rotation 